Hello everyone. I am Sandeep Bhatt. Well, I am not going to bore everyone, everyone with more, more AI related content here. Yeah, before I start, I would like to quickly introduce myself. I got uh, 8 plus years of experience in the industry. I began my career at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, then joined a startup that was eventually acquired by Cisco, where I spent the next one and a half years working on uh, problems around cloud cost optimization. Post that, I joined Walmart, uh, where, where I was part of a team that was responsible for coming up with an in-house load balancer that could uh, scale to a huge amount of traffic, traffic. I mean, especially during the peak holiday season. Then I joined Harness, where I work currently as a staff software engineer. Harness is a company that operates in the DevOps space, and I'm part of a team that is focused on cloud cost optimization. That's, that's mostly about myself, right? We can, we can move on. So the topic that I want to speak today is around creating a custom load balancer using FOSS that can serve huge amount of traffic, right? So before, before we, we go, go there, we would want to see what do you mean by load balancing and when, where is it useful, right? I mean, given that it's, it's cricket World Cup season currently, you would have, I mean, most of you would have come across posts on LinkedIn that says how, how Hotstar is scaling to a huge amount of traffic, right? Well, just to, just to be clear, I'm not going to be discussing more about that here. Just, just, just an example there. But, I mean, oh, oh, I mean if, if Hotstar were, were to serve, serve all those traffic using a single server, would that be really possible? No, right? That's, that's really not, not practical. Which is where we uh, talk about horizontal scaling, wherein you add more nodes to, or more servers or VMs to serve more traffic. So what do you think makes it possible? Like, who actually takes care of distributing the traffic across multiple different servers? That's where you, you need a load balancer. So a lo load balancer basically distributes traffic across multiple different application server VMs. And if some servers were to be unhealthy or, or maybe you have a CPU spike or a memory spike and they, they go, they, they're unusable, it has to take it out of rotation, right? You do, do not forward more traffic to, the, to that. That's the core idea of any load balancer. Thus a load balancer helps with availability and reliability as well as with, with in, with in terms of performance of application, right? If, if a single server were to be bombarded with all the requests, then obviously it's going to be low and latency is going to be high. And that's exactly something that a load balancer helps you with. In, in, in simple terms, if you are to see here, we have application server one and application server two, both of them are healthy. And the, and the load balancer that we have is, is going to serve all the, forward all the traffic to both, of, both the VMs in, in a, say, round robin fashion. Now, assuming one of the servers were to, were to go down because of various reasons, right? Then it would stop serving or forwarding traffic, for, traffic there. It will only end up forwarding all the, the whole set of traffic to application server two. Now, if even application server two were to go down, well, in this case, you can't really do anything with the load balancer. There's just a, just a pause in between there. Like, in this case, you really need to run away from there and, and solve your issues. Coming back to the, the load balancing, when, when it comes to load balancing, like given, given that we are in the cloud, cloud world, what are the options that you have, right? Primarily, when you, when you say load balancing, I mean, people would end up talking about ALB, AWS ALB, or Azure has its own app gateway, and GCP has its own offering, right? And load balancing comes in two ways. You can do load balancing in terms of HTTP traffic, or you can do load balancing in terms, in terms of uh, TCP traffic. We, we will be more, mostly focusing on the HTTP traffic in this case. And given, given, uh, given what I've seen so far, most of the companies, when they, when they incur huge amount of cloud, cloud cost, uh, I mean, most major part of it is due to uh, RDS or databases. And the second one would be ALBs, the, the traffic of ALB as well as the LB usage. This is where we would want to look at, uh, I mean, coming up with a custom load balancer, a, a, an in-house solution. So a FOSS, that I'm, FOSS project that I'm interested in or that, would, that I would like to call out would be Envoy. It's, it's something that, it's a CNCF hosted project. It evolved out of uh, Lyft and it's primarily written using C++ and it's pretty uh, popular in the community with the, in the sense that you have, I mean, a lot of, lot of stars and commits uh, in there. So, I mean, what are the features of, some of the features of Envoy? Let's, let's, let's take a quick look into that. Like uh, Envoy is, is also used in HTO just as a reference, right? And uh, Envoy uh, can be used as a service discovery mechanism. It can be used for load balancing, health checking, and then it, it has a uh, lot of features in in-house in or inbuilt. Now, in terms of uh, some of the key components on, of Envoy, the, the, it's necessary to understand the, the components of Envoy before you, you try to come up with a design for a custom load balancer. Envoy is, is a huge ecosystem. It has a huge amount of or different different uh, set of components in there, but we would be primarily looking at some a couple of them, right? If, if you can see the, the, the flow of a packet or a life of a packet in Envoy, it would be 
there would be a listener. A listener is nothing but the, the port using which you would try to access any, any domain name. Right? Except for example, when you say uh, HTTPS Google.com, you are trying to access Google.com in, in, on port 443, HTTPS port, right? So the listener points to the incoming port. And before, uh, before uh, I mean, the request is forwarded to the actual application VMs, it goes through a, a series of route, route filters, route, route chains, route matching, etc., and also set of filters, uh, filter chains. Like, say, you could write custom filters to uh, individually sniff out different packets or different uh, parts, of a, parts of any request, right? And in terms of cluster, so cluster is nothing but a, I mean, collection of upstreams. Upstreams are, I mean, in short, uh, they, they would be IP addresses of VMs. Right. So, a, a set of IP addresses or VMs that are serving a particular application would together form a single cluster. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean I'm not sure if this is easily visible, but if okay, I don't think. Yeah. So, basically, in short, Envoy can be configured in, in a static fashion or even in a dynamic dynamic way. Like, if you are, if you have to run Envoy with a static configuration, what happen? What would happen is that if you have to make any changes to your routing or or any of your backend targets, you basically end up uh, bringing the system down, you have to restart it again with, with a new config. But you don't want to do that. So we will, we will be primarily using a dynamic configuration. So when we, when we think of designing a custom load balancer, what are the features that we want to primarily target? I mean, obvious one would be that we would want, we would want to be able to distribute traffic across multiple different backend application servers. You want to support multiple domains. You don't want to be supporting only a single domain. When, when I say domain, it can be, say, google.com, qa.google.com, or any, anything like that. And you want to be able to support health checking, that's the, the core feature, right? Wherein if, if some server is unhealthy, you don't want to route any traffic there and hence impact your reliability. And the, and the core other, other aspect that I would want to call out would be cloud agnostic. So if you have to use a, AWS or AWS ALB or even Azure App Gateway, you are, you are stuck with the, the cloud, cloud provider, right? And they have more bargaining power over you in terms of cloud costing and billing. And if you had a custom load balancer that could be easily ported from one cloud to another, you, I mean, you are, you are the boss here, you are, you are the king. And I mean, obviously, scalability is something that everyone wants. Now, this is a design that, that I mean, which, which I will show you in, in, uh, in, a, in a small demo. Like, that, that works out very well. I'm not sure if this is visible, but if you, if you see here, the way we are going to package our custom load balancer would be that we are going to run it on a single virtual machine, possibly. So the, the way that would work is that, and the, the flexibility that you get with this is that you can run it on any VM. The VM can, the specification of the VM can be based on the traffic needs that you have, which basically means that you can you can save cost by uh, using the right set of uh, right kind of VM. Like you can run it on a t2.micro or on a t2.medium or even on a c5.large, right? And the, the way it would work is you would within this single VM you would have two Linux services. We will see what do you mean by a Linux service or how does it look like? And and one of the service would be running Envoy, and the second one would be our custom uh, micro service, uh, which, which would be the control plane. And there would be an interaction uh, using gRPC between Envoy and Control Plane. So the, the, the task of a Control Plane would be to configure Envoy dynamically, right? And we would ho host all our configurations in a database that would uh, reside outside the virtual machine. And there would be an API server that would be providing the, the, the configuration back to our Control Plane. That's the, that's the gist, gist of it. And the way uh, our Control Plane can keep updating the configuration would be that it has to periodically I mean, there are multiple approaches. You could have a WebSocket-based approach, or you could have, a, have it pull an API periodically, or you could even have an event-based system there. And the other key aspect for us would be cloud init. So we will we'll see more of cloud init, cloud init, but basically cloud init helps you with uh, packaging the whole system, right? It's, it's more, more of a way of bringing up a system. So using that, we'll be able to have a uniform way of getting our load balancer up and running across AWS, Azure, and GCP. And this is something that we are, we are already doing at Harness. I mean, a Linux service can be as simple as this, right, for Envoy. I mean, you, you just say this is Envoy, and you are going to say it has to boot up with a minimal set of configuration, right? And then the rest, rest would come through our uh, dynamic configuration. And if you are to, I mean, this might look very scary, but it's not. So we are basically defining what are the, the configurations that Envoy has to look for. It has to look for, I mean, clusters and listeners dynamically. and Eventually, we are going to say, uh, where is our management server going to be? And then the beauty of uh, Envoy is that we mostly spoke about clusters so far being IP addresses. And well, if, if you are to think of it that way, like, well, it can even point to our, our own machine, but a, a different port. In this case, you can see, right, it's pointing to our own machine, but 18,000 being the port. So what, what it means is that we can have a microservice running in the same VM on a different port, which is going to be 
tracked as a cluster within Envoy, and you can you can get Envoy to route certain traffic there, right? And and we are going to say in this case that we are going to use that cluster to be uh, to be the one that Envoy has to look forward to when it comes to any configuration changes. I mean I mean I mean this is a small snippet of the the whole code, right? It's the the code can be pretty simple uh, in terms of how you want to bring the whole thing up. I'm basically running two Go routines here, or if, if somebody is not aware of Go, it's like a I mean sort of a thread equivalent, not not the exact one, but I mean, one would be running our management server, the other one would be fetching the, the configuration periodically. It's, it's as simple as that. I mean, this is more about the, the, the management server that we are talking about, right? We will be running it on an internal port. In, in a small snippet around how you would want to say periodically fetch the configuration. It's like a basic uh, select, uh, select scenario wherein you are having a, time, a, a timer that ticks out and based on that you are going to sync configuration periodically. And all the configuration would be uh, version based on the timestamp. That way you are ensuring that Envoy does not end up rebooting periodically or, or too frequently. And coming back to Cloudinate, right? Cloudinate is, is, a, is an initialization system or package installation system. I mean, it has a lot of uh, different uh, key features, especially when it comes to, I mean, the, the one that you are interested in would be the custom scripts, right? So using Cloudinate, you can you can write a custom script that says, okay, I mean, we have two services that we saw, Envoy as well as our control plane. We are, we are going to say that, okay, download Envoy as well as our control plane from a remote uh, storage like say S3 or anywhere, right? We, we can we can have that being done through custom scripts. And the, and the beauty of uh, Cloudinate would be that, I mean, uh, you, you can configure it to say that, I mean, Cloudinate has to run each time or maybe only once, right? And if you have to say that it has to run each time, what it means is that if you want to update your load balancer remotely, all you have to do would be to reboot your system or your server. And then it will basically trigger the script again and our script will fetch the latest version. So you, you can you can do that seamlessly, and I mean I, I just want to quickly show a small demo of that. I'm not sure if it's showing the whole thing. Yeah, for some reason it's not showing the whole thing, but yeah. Yeah, so I I basically in this scenario I have uh, two VMs. Oh, let me. I basically have two VMs that are running running nginx. Uh, if you just need to look at the IP, right? They have one end suite one one three, the other one would end with seven four. If you have to individually open these IPs, it basically prints the, the, the IP of the VM here, right? Yeah, both of them are printing different one. And I modified my etc host file to say that, okay, when I type sandeepbutt.com, it has to route the request. I mean, it shouldn't be doing any DNS resolution and basically send request to port 80, where I have my current Envoy running. Right. If you see here, you see one uh, address now, 113. If you were to reboot, I mean, it's doing a round robin uh, load balancing, wherein it's sending the, the first request to the, the VM1 and now the, the second one goes to VM2. Now if you have to go here and let's say, let's bring one of them down, right? It's as simple as, let's say, we are, we are injecting an error there, right? So what would happen in this case would be that the load balancer has to identify that the VM is down and not uh, route any request there. I think there's an intermittent lag there, but yeah. All the requests are now going to 113 only, right? And the, yeah, that, that, that's the demo that I want to show. But one, one key aspect that I would want to uh, call out would be that in terms of the advantages of, of a custom load balancer would be that, like one would be in terms of the flexibility, right? You can you can choose the instance type where you want to run it. That way you can provision it in, in the right way without any resource wastage, which which doesn't come with the, any, any native LBs or solutions. And something like say AWS, right? Let's take an example of AWS. The pricing is hourly. You are, you are charged for usage based on hourly pricing. And there is more complex pricing in terms of number of connections retained as well as the, the data being processed. And if you have to take an example of a single region, it can be as simple as a 0 0.0025 0 per hour, which would be close to $16 per month. And here I am ignoring the, the charge uh, incurred by data or, or bytes being processed. If you are to include that, it will come close to $22, $23 per hour. This is for a single ALB. Now, if you are to uh, look at our custom LB, even when VMs or instances or compute instances in, in AWS are charged per, per hour, but since we have the uh, flexibility of the instance type, if you have to choose a smaller instance type based on our usage, say we have to choose t2.micro, it is a specification for a particular instance type. If you have to do that, you, you see the cost there, right? 0 0.0116 per hour, that's close to $8 per month. I mean, it's close to around, you, you, would, you would end up saying 50% 50, um, 50 right, right there, right? And this is at a smaller scale. Now, if you have to extrapolate that into a huge scale, then you end up saving a lot of money, right? And especially given that we are all going through all the recession, et cetera, I think that there's a huge amount of money that you can save. 
I mean, I would like to conclude by saying that, I mean, open source is not just about saving cost, right? It's about investing wisely. Every dollar saved is a dollar earned, which you can invest in, in, in other parts of your business. And all it takes is, is a bit of tinkering and curiosity. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you are using dynamic configuration to avoid restarting the load balancer. Yeah. Uh, what is the advantage of using this instead of simply using signals like Nginx does where it doesn't lose a request, but whenever it receives a USR1 uh, signal, it just reloads the configuration. Is there any major advantage of uh, switching to dy dynamic configuration instead of doing something as simple as that? I mean, I mean, if you were to talk in terms of envoy based approach, then well, I mean, static one would mean that it's, I mean, it, it would be pretty difficult to manage the whole configuration of say, I mean, if you were to say auto scale for some for some reason, right, you would be having new VMs coming up, and again, maybe you're down scaling, you'd have VMs going down, right? In this point, updating that would be way too frequent action. Using dynamic one, it basically is a seamless action, and you can use a single custom load balancer to host multiple different domains again. That's that's an added advantage. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you, hi. I'm not, yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you run your custom load balancer on a VM itself, right? Correct. What if that VM goes down? How do you manage reliability in production use cases then? Correct, yeah. I mean, in terms of scalability for this one, you, you, it can be done in multiple ways. One would be vertical scaling, which, which basically is about using different instance type, right? Like you could scale the CPU and RAM vertically, like you can increase that. In terms of the horizontal scaling, it's all about duplicating the same same thing into two or three versions, right? Say, for example, a complex architecture, one thing that I came across in one of my previous roles is around, say, somebody had Akamai CDNs and, I mean, and behind them you had FI firewalls or WAP, and then it went through multiple different hops of load balances, DNS based load balancing, software based, et cetera. Now, in this case, I mean, if you were, if you were to replace those DNS or software based load balancers with a custom version, what would happen is that you, you would basically multiple instances of our custom load balancer would be a backend target to the, the web firewall, FI firewall basically. Right? In that case, we well, easily end up saving, saving a lot of money there. We used to uh, have the issue of uh, reliability even there with, with the other load balancer. Got it. So you, okay. can, you can scale it multiple ways. You, I mean, multiple copies of the same one would eventually have the same, uh, same configuration, right? It's like eventual consistency there. But there will be a root uh, load balancer, right? Even if you have multiple correct. hops, at the end of the day, it would point to only one, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, I mean, most of the architectures in, in enterprises do not tend to have just one single load balancer. There is really, is a WAF, and then, then there is, I mean, Akamai, everything comes in. There's a chain of hops before it actually reaches the application server. This, this can be something that saves a lot in the, in the intermediate hops, possibly. Yeah. 